Not too much longer after that, I made a mixtape. Stayed in bed all morning just to pass the time. There's something wrong here, there can be no denying. One of us is changing, or maybe we've just stopped trying. And it's too late, baby, now it's too late. Though we really did try to make it. Something inside is dying and I can't hide and I just can't fake it, oh no. To quote Tom Waits, it was a hubba hubba ding dang ding, baby you got everything. And a week later it was a hubba hubba ding dang dong, baby sure didn't last too long. He puts it even better later on in that song when he says, well the extended outlook for an indefinite period of time until you come back to me baby, is high tonight, low tomorrow, and precipitation is expected. And that's what it was like. And then she did come back to me, and then I came back to her, and then we came back to each other, and then we'd break up, and we did it again and again and again. Lather, rinse, repeat, repeat, repeat. And she became the woman I just couldn't wash out of my hair, and it became the relationship that just wouldn't die. So many stakes pounded right through my heart and right through her heart, and the relationship just kept coming back to life like one of those stupid zombies you see in TV or in the movies that gets knocked down and dragged out and dirtier and wounded and broken and gross in a torn and tattered plaid flannel shirt, but it just keeps coming at you to eat your flesh and consume your brain and to gnaw on your tender heart until you too join the putrid ranks of the fetid undead. We killed the body of the beast, but we couldn't quite smite its foolishly intrepid head. And it was just about then, and the irony was totally lost on me at the time, that I got a call to work on a zombie movie. A little background. A friend of mine, let's call him Jonathan, because that's his real name, is a movie producer, and he works all over the place, but mostly around here in my home, the Hudson Valley. And over the years, he would call me from time to time and say, hey, we need bodies. Want to come make a few bucks, get a free meal, be an extra in a movie? Only they don't call them extras. They call them background. And it's kind of a boring gig, but you get to meet a lot of interesting people and share this weird kind of camaraderie with them about being all together and all being bored all together. And then suddenly having to hurry to another place and stand around and be all bored all together in this new place. And then all of a sudden having to act. Act surprised! Act disappointed. Act like you're in a relationship that just won't die. Anyway, Jonathan would hire me from time to time, and that's how I met the casting people, Heidi and Amy. And that's how I ended up getting a call one day from Amy, who was thoroughly adorable and delightfully flirty, and she calls and cycles through the usual pleasantries and whatnot, and then gets right down to brass tacks. How tall am I? How much do I weigh? And how would I like a two-month gig being a stand-in and a photo double for an A-list celebrity whose name she can't reveal to me, and would I be open to shaving off my beard? And I would make about 200 bucks a day being a stand-in and about $650 a day being a photo double and say no more. Yes, count me in and goodbye beard. Well, I started doing the math right away. I was going to pay off some serious debts and maybe even make a down payment on a new car. Maybe more reasonably, this one. Regardless, it was going to be great being a stand-in and even better being a photo double. And for an A-list celebrity, no less. Now, a little more background. Let me digress one second here and explain about my sciatica. It's a back condition that, for me anyway, if you stand in one place for more than a few minutes, it starts to really hurt. And your back starts to ache, and you get kind of numb, and maybe one of your legs does too. And I can recall exactly when I got the back injury 22 years ago that led to the sciatica today. I recall as clear as can be the foolishly macho, I can do this, posturing that led to the crushed desk that led to the sciatic and led to me learning my lesson about not making stupid decisions and led to the certain knowledge that sadly it would not be a smart move for someone with that condition to take a job standing in for anyone. So I said yes. And about six weeks later, I got the call that I had been hired and could I start the following week and that I would be standing in for Bill Murray. 
come on. Saturday Night Live, Caddyshack, Groundhog Day, Meatballs, Stripes, that movie where he played a Jacques Cousteau kind of character, and of course Lost in Translation, where he kind of played himself, not just A-list, an icon. And now I was gonna meet him, work with him, probably hang out and be buddies and have martinis and play golf. <laughs> oh, the chuckles we would have. And naturally, he would want to become my patron and buy all my paintings and sculptures, and I would finally be able to pay my electric bill and my gas bill at the same time, like forever and ever. And my relationship, the one that wouldn't die, well, maybe now it could live, because she would be so impressed with me and my new best friend and wouldn't be so intermittently and understandably discouraged by the dismal earnings potential of a patronless artist who can't even pay his bills. So I show up on the first day of work. I've got my little white PBS tote bag packed with a book, a pen, some spare clothes, my hopes and fantasies, and a baggie of 12-hour Aleve. Naproxen sodium, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, all day strong for the sciatica. And I get there early and I meet my minder, a seriously sweet kid from Brooklyn, vaping and talking a mile a minute and having an endless supply of ballpoint pens for filling out forms, or maybe no pens at all, and tending to a million things and all in all kind of a pied piper for us stand-ins to follow around, around the set. On this first day, it's just Bill Murray's stand-in, me, and Adam Driver's stand-in, Brennan a 19-year-old kid who the casting lady, Heidi, discovered while he was slinging half-calf, half-decaf, half-and-half double caramel grande macchiatos at the mud puddle in the New Paltz. As the movie progressed, there were another dozen stand-ins for another dozen amazing celebrities. Tom Waits, Tilda Swinton, Danny Glover, Steve Buscemi, Iggy Pop, Carol Kane, Chloe Sevigny, Rosie Perez, Selena Gomez, Riza from Wu-Tang Clan, and Caleb Landry Jones, just to name a few. For now, though, it's just me and Brennan, and we fill out a bunch of forms and get in our cop costumes, identical to the ones that will be worn by the stars. And we listen to our Pied Piper lay down some rules one of which is that under no circumstances are we to initiate conversations with any of the celebrities we will be encountering on set. Just don't do it. And we're good listeners and don't have any questions, and so by and by, Nikos, our Pied Piper, leads us to the actual set. One part of a big warehouse in Kingston where they're shooting a bunch of the green screen stuff, and Nikos tells us to stand right there, and so we do, and so until someone else comes over and says, you can't stand here and they are not impressed with the logistical authority of Nikos, who has now disappeared to Pied Pipe a whole nother set of nobodies to somewhere else. And so we move a few feet over, which is evidently okay, and I sit down, not too uncomfortably, on a little ledge, because, you know, standing is not so good for me. And right away, this guy walks over to where we are, and I have to stand up again because it's Bill Murray in a cop costume, just like mine. And he steps right in front of me, and looks me in the eye and holds out his hand and says, hi, I'm Bill. And yeah, that's the shit I'm talking about because I am sure that he recognizes me immediately as a comedic kindred spirit. And I take his hand and I look him in the eye and say, hi, Norm Magnuson. And he says, wait for it. He says, hi, again, and walks off. And you know, it's kind of a stretch to see this brief exchange as a meeting of the minds, a lightning bolt of immediate affinity, but that doesn't stop me from projecting forward to poolside at Khan, chillin' with Bill, and I'll probably have some kind of cute pet name for him by then, and having a bunch of fun in the sun and surf. And just then, my little reverie is interrupted by a voice I would hear hundreds of times over the next two months, a voice calling, second team! And we spring into action and start walking the eight short steps to where the voice came from, when the voice repeats again, like a second and a half later, only this time, with maximum miffed intonation, second team! And we say, here we are. And the voice belonging to the second second assistant director, his actual job title, now has a body attached to it. And attached to the body are numerous headphones and walkie-talkies and whatnot. And the second second AD wastes no time jumping right in and putting us in our place. Listen, guys, when I call second team or that's a wrap or moving on, you need to be right here. 
I shouldn't have to call you a second time. And because we're brand new and kind of want the jobs, we don't point out that he really did not need to call us a second time because really we were right there kind of already. And also right there is a cop car, a movie car with no windshield and a bunch of fake plants around it and some fans and a few dozen people moving plants and lights and cords and backdrops and cameras and whatnot. And the second second AD tells us to sit in the car and to wait further instructions, and so we do. And we're an island of quietude in the midst of a hurricane of filmmaking prep activity, and the gang is all there, including Jim Jarmusch, the only guy in the set cooler than Bill Murray. And he comes over, and first thing out of his mouth is, wow, such handsome stand-ins. And then he introduces himself, and then he introduces the director of photography, Fred, and then they start right in, looking right through us and talking about us as if we're not even there, discussing the intricacies of light and shadow and framing and camera angle and whatnot. And eventually we just start chatting to each other. Adam Driver stand in and Bill Murray stand in until after an interminable amount of adjustments are made to the fans and the plants and the lights and the camera and everything is just right and just so. And then the first team is called in. And that's Bill and Adam Driver themselves, the actual stars, the first team. And so we get out of the car and they get in and right away Bill comments that the seat's too warm. And I make a mental note to myself because I'm a professional after all, to try and lower my body temperature next time. And after this more or less uneventful first day of shooting at that huge warehouse in Kingston, the highlight of which was Bill buying ice cream sandwiches for the entire cast and crew. After that first day of fantasy versus reality, the production moved out to a little town in the West Catskills with really the perfect name for a zombie movie. Fleshman's. Fleshman's, get it? Could there be a better name? Well, evidently so, because in the movie it's called Centerville. But Fleshman's itself is really quite a town. You drive in and the first thing you notice is that the sidewalks are packed with Hasidic Jews, all dressed in all black in the middle of summer with their big hats or fur hats or yarmulkes. And the next thing you notice are all the Hispanics, all of them evidently working for the Hasids doing construction and renovation. Later on you notice a certain other kind of local and their big diesel Dodge pickup trucks with the gun racks in the rear window and American flags all over them and their build the wall bumper stickers and that special little modification that allows them to belch noxious black smoke all over you on command. A cute little assertion of aggressive environmental ignorance called rolling coal. True blue, red, white, and blue hillbillies and Oh, how I hate that my flag, the flag of give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the flag of inclusion has come to be used as a symbol of hate and exclusion by a whole group of insular xenophobic separatists all over this country. But back to that little town with the perfect name for a zombie movie. Because now one more distinct group has joined its population. Hollywood types, producers, caterers, security, second, second ADs, and so on. It was a strange and not always comfortable commingling of this bizarro contemporary 4-H club, Hasids, Hispanics, Hillbillies, and Hollywood. But we were all mostly making the best of it, and I was even kind of enjoying it, proud of my work. As proud as one can be when one's work consists entirely of standing where you're told and taking your daily dose of 12-hour leave on time and not being too much of a fuss budget and keeping the fuck out of the way or else face the wrath of the movie gods. In this case, there were two of them, okay, tons of them really, because movies are a phenomenally collaborative art form, but two main ones who were in charge of us chattel the stand-ins. The first was Will, the second second AD, and he was mostly nice, and unless the movie god directly above him wasn't being nice. And that guy, I kid you not, was named Attila. Attila was from South Africa or Turkey or Mongolia or someplace or all of the above, and he was a little tightly wound and a little bit crazy and tense in his eyes, but he was one of the only movie gods who ever came over and asked me a few questions about me 
who am I, where do I live, what do I do? Upon hearing my answer, I'm an artist, he suddenly had to go, and honestly, I don't blame him. You do not want to get me talking about that shit. So I'm there doing that stuff one day a number of weeks into the shoot with Brennan and now Chloe Sevigny stand in has joined us. She's Nicole, an old pro and all around kooky sweet character who knew everything about the ins and outs and intricacies of the stand in biz because that's her job, her only job. Jeremiah, the guy in the Vance t-shirt was kind of a free floating stand in and he was there too with a bunch of other old pros. And we're all sitting in the small shade of one of those little pop-up tent-like things, the kind you see at street fairs and churchyard sales and family reunions and Dallas Cowboys tailgate parties. And I'm reading the same sentence for the 12th time in my dense, wonderfully dense biography of John Cage when Nikos, the extras wrangler, comes running over our little corner saying, they need more zombies. And would any of us like to be zombies for the day? Now, keep in mind for this next bit, the film business is seriously hierarchical. On the very top, it's the studio or the investors or someone you can't even see from where I was standing. But on the set, the director seems mostly to be the boss and then maybe the producers who are there holding the purse strings and then maybe the stars and then the first assistant director, Attila, and then the director of photography and then a few dozen other people, including grips and key grips and props people and best boys and even the second second AD and so on and so forth until you get right down to the very bottom and right there just the teeniest smidge beneath the very bottom of the pile are the stand-ins. Me and those others. All of us actual humans, many accomplished actors in their own right, but whose sole qualification for this gig is being the same height, weight, and color as the famous person we're representing sentient pieces of cardboard, more or less. No thinking, no speaking, no moving, and less told to move. And the strangest thing, after a while or so of doing this, it really started to feel like a vacation. See, I've been self-employed for like 30 years, a long time, and working as an artist for all those years, seeking my fame as an artist. Don't get me wrong, it's a great life, even if it's not much of a living. And I count my blessings that I get to spend so much of my time thinking about art and making art, and sometimes advertising. It's a pretty sweet gig, even if money's always a problem. The struggle to get famous so that you won't have those money problems is a little bit, well, kind of makes you sick of yourself sometimes. The nonstop grind of chronic attempts at tasteful self-aggrandizement tasteful self-aggrandizement. It's like one of those George Carlin oxymorons, jumbo shrimp, military intelligence, resident alien. But the stand-in gig, it was kind of a nice break from all that humble bragging. The job is not to look good or to be smart or to be creative or to be awesome in any way at all that's about you. The whole thing was a lovely long exercise in ego sublimation, just kind of burying that old ego completely and being the best nobody in aspiring somebody could ever be. As Adam Driver kept telling Bill throughout the filming, you've got to kill the head. And that's what I had to do too. Ages ago, when marketers first spoke of young, upwardly mobile professionals as a demographic, the opposite of that designation popped up too. Gnerpies, going nowhere ever rural proletariat. Well, that was my voyage every day I went to the set, the journey from striving yuppie artist to non-striving gnerpy stand-in, useful for running through the action of a scene and or lighting a scene, which can take forever and frequently does, as the director of photography makes endless adjustments to get things just exactly, precisely, perfectly right. Here's a movie joke. Why can't directors of photography smoke? because it takes them forever to light anything. <laughs> but back to the action. Nikos asking us who wants to be a zombie. And I'm like, fuck yeah. And the other newbie standards are all like, fuck yeah too. But the experienced standards were like, nah. We weren't hired to work background. To which Nikos adds, you'll still get paid the stand-in rate. Because it turns out that even though stand-ins are the very bottom of the movie set hierarchy, there's one tier even lower, the background, which is how I started in this whole biz. 
And as it turns out that they get paid less and don't even get to eat at the same time as us. Holy crap, I had no idea you could get lower than where we were. As the writer Larry McMurtry put it, lower in a snake belly in a wheel rut. Or as my mom used to say, like a penny waiting for change. So Nicole and Jess and Bobby and the rest of the experienced stand-ins just wanted to sit in the shade and relax instead of getting dressed up in heavy wardrobe and thick makeup and or plastic masks and ugly heavy coats on this sweltering 112 degree summer's day. Whatever, idiots. But all of us newbie stand-ins say yes to Nikos, and so we get on the bus back to base camp and head into wardrobe, hair, and makeup to get transformed into zombies. And we get to choose makeup or mask. And I cleverly decide on the mask, because then I won't have to do all the heavy makeup. And I tell them this, and they nod and seem to appreciate the wisdom of my reasoning. And then all of a sudden, it's just like that old joke, Death or Juju, where the captured hunter, given a choice, but seeing the horrors that befell those who had previously chosen Juju, chooses death, upon which his captors all reply in unison, Death, but first Juju. And so I went into makeup before I got my thick rubber mask. Neck, hands, eyes, arms, thick, tarry makeup slathered on with evidently not a thought in the world about having to take it back off eight or 12 hours down the road. And I get the makeup and the gloves and the mask with a heavy head of fake hair and a thick t-shirt and a thick coat and get shipped back out to the cemetery, the actual graveyard where they were shooting. And that graveyard out there in Fleshman's, amazing. On one side, all the names are Smith and O'Donnell and Van Dyke. And then the other side, seriously, all the names are Cohen and Goldberg and Rabinowitz. Tracing the transformation of this tiny Catskills Hamlet through those who have passed through and passed on. Soon enough, I suspect there will be a section in the cemetery devoted to Gonzalez, Garcia, and Lopez, for example. And someday, if all the people all get along and make nice and commingle and connect just right, maybe there will be a whole section of the cemetery with names like Javier Horwitz O'Connor, also known as Billy Bob. But for now, as before, we're just standing around waiting to be yelled at in the hot 112 degree sun, and it kind of sucks. Except that I met a whole slew of fun people out there during the breaks. I met the award-winning poet, Amy King. I met the casting person's husband, Wayne, an amazingly talented and happy sweet guy. And I met the nicest young zombie, Joe, a super talented kid, the nobody most likely to become a somebody. And I met a whole slew of other background players who I've seen since then working on other films around the area. And this is one of the things that really impressed me about the movie, and I assume it's like this on most film sets. On day one, all the crew, there are about 90 of them, arrive and start gooing and cooing and kissing and hugging each other like it's the first day of summer camp and they're being reunited with all their old friends from Cabin 19 who they haven't seen for an entire school year. It's the sweetest thing. And it got me to thinking about people all working together to create something special and the camaraderie and connection that is built through shared hardship and hard work. Now, these people have three meals a day and little bags of fair trade kale chips and organic chocolate chunk macadamia nut cookies and iced coffee with hazelnut flavored coffee mate whenever they want. But they work long, hard hours all together. It's all out for 30 or 40 or 50 days for them, working together to get shit done on time. Because there's always a deadline and a budget pushing right up behind it. They only get so many days to make this thing, and they better fucking hustle to get it done. Especially when they're dropping hundreds of thousands of dollars a week on payroll alone. And we're all there, stand-ins and background and crew, movie gods and movie schlubs alike in the graveyard on the Van Buren side, and some of us, like me, are dressed up like zombies or being told to move here or move there or, when things are really exciting, to walk like zombies towards the camera. And I realized at this point that if I was actually going to be in this movie, it would be that scene. Because when I'm standing in for Bill Murray or being his photo double driving the cop car, for example, you will never see me. 
unless you stop the film and blow it up really big. And who in the world would ever do that? But as a zombie, I might just make it to the silver screen. And after that, who knows what could happen? And all of a sudden, being in front of the camera, being in front of a rolling camera, all the ego and all the fantasy comes rushing back. And I start hamming it up, chewing the scenery, as they say. And I decide on my limp, and my affectation. And I, I decide I'm going to throw my right hand over my left forearm and kind of shake it like so. And so I do that, take after take. And in my head, I'm imagining a scenario where seeing this, Jarmusch stops the action and asks me what the hell I'm doing. And in the little fantasy movie in my head, my answer is so smart and personal and emotionally raw that after the day's shooting, he sends for me. We spend a pleasant evening with Billin and Iggy and Steve and Tilda and Tom and other incredibly articulate and fun people sipping single malt whiskeys I'd never even heard of and playing modern jazz records on an old turntable of gems and laughing like mad at everything. But then, in an inexplicable fantasy downgrade in my own head, it's now not Jarmusch, but the second second AD who is screaming at me, Baxter! I was wearing a filthy t-shirt from wardrobe that had that word on the front. Baxter, what the hell are you doing? Why are you shaking your hand like that? And again, in my head, in my little overactive imagination, after a thoughtful pause, mind you, to show that I hadn't been planning this answer all along, I reply, well, zombie movies are, essentially, whether the auteur thinks of them as such or not, memento mori, remembrances of those who have already passed. In addition, one speculative origin of the zombie mythology comes from the Middle Ages where people suffering stroke or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or dementia would be out cold, seemingly dead, and would wake up or come back to life manifesting certain physical limitations, a limp, a lisp, a shaky hand. Symptom clusters that have found their way into popular depictions of zombies, including those here in this movie. My father suffered from one of those diseases, dementia, and one of his first symptoms was a shaky hand, like the one I'm doing here. So as a remembrance of my own dearly departed dad, and also as a nod to one possible origin of the zombie mythology, I chose this movement. Plus, no one else was doing it, so it seemed to expand the present repertoire of zombie interpretations, and that seemed like a fine choice to make as an actor and a team player. And there I am, once again, in my mind's vivid fantasy world. Did I mention it's 112 degrees? A smart and sensitive and articulate and, well, lovable person who will certainly eventually be recognized as such and will certainly eventually be taught all the secret handshakes and be given the all points, all excess pass to that room beyond the room backstage. But in reality, they never did stop the scene to ask me what the fuck I was doing and never listened with awe as I gave my thoughtful and intelligent reply. And the fantasy life slipped away into the heat and haze of the afternoon and the day of being a zombie passed by without any further incident. Without any incident at all, really, not even an ice cream sandwich. And the next day, it was back to the job of being the best little nobody I could be, reading my book, sitting in a gray folding chair, under the flimsy white canopy of anonymity. And the book I was reading was this. And person after person, including Bill, would come by and say, hey, what are you reading? And then wander right off as soon as I told them. I'm not sure what book would have gotten folks to stick around and really want to discuss, but it was certainly not this wonderfully thought-provoking biography of John Cage by Kay Larson, the subtitle of which is John Cage, Zen Buddhism, and the Inner Life of Artists. Now, one of the things the author talks about in this book is connection and connectedness and the connectedness of everything in all of creation. And it's something I think about a lot, the idea of being connected to everything and everyone and not being separate from it all. And how much better the world would be if we all felt this way. And I remember big moments, advances in that kind of thinking for me, like when we moved to Woodstock after 22 years in New York City and London and Paris and New Zealand and sort of a citizen of the world settling into a small town pace and kind of 
kind of feeling separate from it until one fateful, consequential day in Walmart. I was there looking at the people of Walmart, kind of thinking, oh, well, look at all those people in Walmart, so very interesting. But then I realized all of a sudden, I was not separate from them. In fact, now I was one of them, and that we all together were Walmart shoppers. And I thought of that great Groucho Marx line about how he would never want to be in a club that would have him as a member. But there I was. I was now in that club. And maybe it seems strange for Walmart to be the locus of a profound advancement in one's thinking about connection, but evidently I'm not the only one. And all of this, all of this is a bit of a chuckle, but it's also exactly how it happened. And it's really, truly important because true, wonderful connectedness can't flow from an us versus everyone else perspective, a perspective of separateness, much less superiority. A perspective of global, universal connection is much lovelier and much more helpful and is a goal I've been working toward for years, a goal that we should all be working towards, especially now. And this book, amongst other things, was all about that for me. And like many other people throughout history working towards that goal, I have had some success, moments of success, moments of perfect connectedness. Not usually when I'm in Walmart, mind you, but also not usually when I'm meditating, for example. These moments, they just show up, and not often enough. But one beautiful, cool morning on the set of this Jim Jarmusch zombie movie, sitting under the tent, this time on the Rosenstein side of the cemetery, as the morning sun rose over the trees and the heavy fog of dawn dissipated, being seamlessly replaced by an identical fog of insects rising and falling from the freshly warming grass. I had such a moment, a moment of perfect connection. And it was a beautiful thing. They always are. And like those moments, historically for me, it lasted approximately a millisecond until my ego mind, my hyperactive, overthinking monkey brain, jumped in and noticed that my deeper being was having a moment. Oh my God, oh my God, you're having a moment. And poof, it was gone. Another sad victim to the relentless ruiner of so much overthinking. But there was a happy glow that remained. And as often happened, I started thinking about the nature of these moments, these fleeting, brief, beautiful, thin happenings that almost exist beyond any conception of time, or at least the constraints of time. Moments when everything has ceased to be separate from me and I have ceased to be separate from it. I used to call them moments of perfect contentment. And then Spalding Gray came along with his fabulous monologue, Swimming to Cambodia, and he referred to these moments as perfect moments. So I adopted that phrase for a while. Then I came to realize that what they really were for me were moments of perfect connectedness. And in that morning's moment on the cool lawn of the cemetery, and in the residual moments that followed it, I felt so good and so perfectly connected and so much a part of the hubbub and hustle of the 90 people there in that graveyard preparing for the day's shoot, and it was wonderful. And then it was gone. Even eventually the afterglow itself trailed off and the noises out there were back out there and the me in here was back in here and the stand-ins and the background zombies and all of us were just there together but apart in this beautiful place, which was really a not too shabby way to be and a not too shabby place to be. All of us and a bunch of gawkers. A small gaggle of local Hasidic men had gathered and were watching the activity and had wandered over to our tent. And as it turned out, one of the zombies, a sweet young man named Tristan, began speaking to the young Hasids in Hebrew. And it was a beautiful moment in its own right. A couple of H's from this bizarro 4-H club conglomeration connecting in a common language. And just like my moment of perfect connection, this one, too, was too fleeting. Before I could even get my camera out, the young Hasids were gone, and our beloved, kooky, Chloe Sevigny stand-in Nicole leaned over toward the zombie extra Tristan, who moments before had been speaking Hebrew to the young Hasids, all dressed up in their garb, and Nicole says excitedly to zombie Tristan, I didn't know you spoke Amish. And we all started razzing our pal Nicole. We started razzing her about her mistake. And it was all good-natured, but still, 
I almost didn't want to share that story here. Even though it, w it was a hilarious highlight of the experience, it seemed maybe a little bit poking fun. But instead of feeling superior or separate from that snafu, I had a perspective shift and I connected to it. And all of a sudden, it wasn't Nicole out there all by her lonesome making a spectacular gaffe. It was me, it was all of us. All of us who don't know or don't know yet or forgot or in any other way, shape or form, just get things wrong. As I memorably did one night in the back of the bus and the bus back to base camp. I always climbed all the way to the back because, you know, load from the rear. And on this particular night, Bill comes all the way back too. It's a big van, really, not a bus. A rental from some movie rental place. And there are four rows of seats and an aisle down the middle. And I'm in the way back enjoying yet another ice cream sandwich, courtesy of Bill. When Bill comes back and sits there too, just across the aisle from me. And the number one directive from Nikos comes popping it in my head, as it always does. Don't talk to the celebrities unless spoken to. And the van takes off. It takes off across the bumpy back roads of Fleshman's. And Bill says something that I don't quite hear, but I think I do and I don't want to ignore him. And I think maybe it's a complaint about how it can't be good for the van to be driving so fast over all these bumps. And so I say, well, it's a rental. And Bill kind of looks at me like I'm insane and says, rental? As if what I just said made no sense at all and in no universe possible could ever be construed to make anything even resembling sense. And it all came rushing back, all those times I'd said something like that in high school or college or grade school or last week or whenever, and the cool kids or whoever rolled their eyes and whispered whatever and continued on doing whatever they were doing and wherever they were going. However, now it wasn't Timmy and Rico and Big J and Clarksy. It was Bill freaking Murray and I just withered. My mind raced. I assumed I'd misheard him or something, but I also strongly suspected that I had just been put by Bill Murray, no less, into that timeless category of people who say weird shit that doesn't make any sense. A category of people who most assuredly do not get invited for classic cocktails and modern jazz on vintage vinyl. All those things, those myriad things for each and almost every one of us that puts us out there and everyone else over here unless we're feeling more perfectly connected in our successes and in our triumphs and in our blunders and in our basic, essential, undeniably flawed shared humanity. And I realized there's a whole damn business that perpetuates and profits from that dark dynamic of disconnection, exclusion and exclusivity. But it's not the movie business, it's the business of celebrity. And that business is played out from the time we're tiny and one kid swings higher than everyone else on the swing set. And we all hear the myth about the playground superstar who swang so high, they swang all the way around. And we see the popular kids and the smart kids and the talented kids. And even if we're kind of maybe a little bit one of them, there's always somebody more popular or more smart, even if it's on TV and they're a Jeopardy champion or a Kardashian. And it strikes me there in the back of that minibus that it really couldn't be more natural, this self-imposed, particularly human construct, this wholesale buying into the hierarchy of celebrity, which puts some people way up there and others way down here, couldn't be more natural, but how we deal with it couldn't be less. Look at the animal kingdom, survival of the fittest, and look again, they're just not self-conscious about it at all. They have hierarchy, sure, we call it the food chain but they live within them just as comfortably and naturally as can be. And those who are in the bottom rung are just happy being there, perfectly contented, just being connected to the big beautiful cycle of life. The worm gets eaten by the robin, who's eaten by the fox, who's eaten by the mountain lion, who eventually feeds the worms, and so on and so forth ad infinitum. And they just don't overthink it, they just are. And Nicole makes a funny and I make a dummy and Bill Murray gives me a look. But here we all are, celebrity or schlub, hillbilly, Hasid or Hispanic, the 90 hardworking crew members, even the second second AD, all of us eating our ice cream sandwiches and getting the chocolate bits stuck to our fingers in just the same way. Each of us individual, but none of us truly separate. And every day we all have to make the same elemental choice to build connections or to build walls. Connections are the natural choice and are infinitely more fun. Thank you.